My name is Kathy Carmichael, and I'm a dietitian here at Pennington Biomedical Research Center. And I'm here with Stephanie Loop, uh, the Executive Director for Nutrition for the Louisiana Department of Education. And we wanna welcome you to today's School Food Waste webinar. First, I'll provide a brief introduction, um, and then I'll hand the screen over to our speakers. And we have reserved the last 10 minutes for questions, comments, um, just to kind of have a little discussion. Uh, we will also utilize the chat. So while the speakers are talking, if you think of a question, you can write it in the chat so you don't forget, so we can make sure that we can talk about it at the end. Um, but just to kind of give an overview, in 2015, uh, the USDA and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, announced that uh, the United States' first ever national food waste reduction goal is calling for a 50% reduction by 2030. And we know that K through 12 schools have a special role in not only reducing, recovering, and recycling food waste on their premises, but also in educating the next generation about the importance of food conservation and recovering wholesome excess food. So in the next hour, we hope to bring awareness to school food waste in Louisiana particularly, but also beyond, and provide some proven strategies that are simple and cost-effective that we can implement in our schools. Our speakers today are Steven Sturdivant from the Environmental Protection Agency and Melissa Plouffe Prescott from Case Western University. Steven is an environmental engineer and regional coordinator for the United States EPA Region 6's Sustainable Management of Food Program. He has worked in the agency for over 16 years. Uh, Dr. Prescott is a registered dietitian and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, she reaches solutions to simultaneously improve diet quality and environmental stewardship in school and community settings. And she has published more than 20 peer reviewed manuscripts on school nutrition programs. She was awarded a postdoctor postdoctoral fellowship from the USDA National Institute of Food and Ag, which focuses on food waste reduction and food recovery in school nutrition programs. Her past experiences, including managing a school-based obesity prevention program across seven elementary schools in Harlem and Washington Heights in New York City, and serving on the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics House of Delegates. She completed her PhD in public health at NYU, New York University, and her undergraduate degree in dietetics at the University of Florida. So first, we're going to start with Stephen from the EPA, followed by Melissa, and then we'll have our questions and answers. So we'll give the floor uh, to Stephen. All right. Here we go. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency is tasked with protecting human health and the environment. And one of its priorities is around food and our food choices. So why is that? Why is the EPA focusing on food? You know, when I eat food and, and throw it away, it, it turns into dirt, right? It's non-hazardous. What's the big deal, right? Well, it turns out there's a huge environmental cost to make our food. And so we're going to explore what are the impacts our food choices have on the environment and what are some easy, simple things we could do to reduce those impacts. My goal today, hopefully, is to um, help motivate you and, and share more awareness to you know, see the true cost of our food choices, not what's reflected in the price tag but the true costs to human health and the environment. So that, that's my, my hope today. So I hope you're open-minded about that. And uh, please ask yourself throughout this presentation, is what I'm hearing actionable? Is, is what I'm hearing serious enough for me to change my habits? Okay, so here we go. So what impacts are we talking about? We hear a lot about climate change and for good reason. What is less talked about is water pollution. Right? Would you be surprised to learn that the main cause of water pollution in our rivers comes from our food production? That's right. We're talking about like the fertilizer and animal waste that gets washed off farms and concentrates into our waterways. It can create toxic algae blooms, robs the water of oxygen. It can kill fish and creates an ocean dead zone in the Gulf, like you see there in that photo. 
This is called nutrient pollution, and it's one of America's most widespread, costly, and challenging environmental problems. And our food choices can play a critical role. Let's learn about another impact, land system change, right? We're talking about like habitat destruction, destroying nature, right? The main cause of deforestation, wetlands reductions, habitat loss, biodiversity loss is food production. That's right. We, we use more land for food production than any other human activity. And we're, we're putting pressure to destroy these natural ecosystems to make way for more food production, right? So it's, it's important that we don't waste this precious resource. And also what you're seeing in front of you is carbon. That's right. Nature can be a carbon sink, a, a, a machine we don't even have to build that can pull carbon right out of the air, right? But if we go in and destroy nature, then carbon goes up. So what we decide to do with land plays a critical role in climate change as well. And we're going to learn more about that later. Okay. The EPA came out with a report that looked at the impacts of just the food we throw away. Let's explore that, right? Food waste, right? Here is an example of, of the food available to Americans. The white box represents what we, what we eat, excuse me. And the blue is what's left. And it's more than enough to feed all food insecure Americans. We waste a lot of food. How much food do we waste compared to other countries? Well, here it is per person per day. Here's the United States. How much food do we waste compared to other countries? You can see that even low income countries that may not have the type of infrastructure that we have, they still manage to waste far less food. So the EPA sees that there's a huge opportunity here. We need to understand the true impacts. So if you take away anything from this presentation, take away this. It's not just the food you're wasting. You're also wasting the resources that we all need to share and the pollution that affects us all, right? The cropland that could have been natural habitat rich with biodiversity and carbon. Fresh water, do this for me. You can take this number, 151 liters per person per day, and compare that number to your water bill you might be surprised to learn that you're wasting more water in the food you're throwing away than your entire household. You know, we see the water go down the drain, the sinks, the showers, the toilets, and we try to reduce that water. But what we don't see is the water needed to grow our food, right? The irrigation. We don't see the aquifers throughout the United States that are being depleted faster than the rate of recharge. Some rivers are not even reaching the ocean anymore, right? This is an impact. Fertilizer, we're wasting fertilizer and it's contributing to that water pollution, right? And we're going to talk about emissions. So this report looked at a bunch of different studies. You can see four studies here, for example, that looked at food waste. Each color represents a different type of food waste. You can see a lot of fruits and vegetables are wasted. That's what we see. What do we not see? The emissions impact of food waste, right? It tells a different story. For example, Meat, poultry, and eggs, we don't throw away much of it, but the little that we do throw away represents the biggest share of emissions impact from food waste, greenhouse gas emissions impact. And why is that? It's because different foods have different impacts on the environment. You can see here the emissions impact of different food choices. Some foods cause more emissions than others. So now we know. When we waste food, we waste fertilizer, a lot of it's going to animal feed and land, a lot of crop land. Most of it is going to animal feed, right? It, most of the crops we grow in the United States are not even fed to humans, right? Is this an efficient use of our crop land? Where is food waste occurring? All along the supply chain, a lot of it is in the house and at restaurants, right? And it, at restaurants, it's mostly at the table where customers are. So it's consumer behavior that is driving a lot of this. And there is some, a lot of waste at farms. A lot of it is perfectly good to eat unharvested crops that just don't meet certain cosmetic standards. It might have a bug bite in it or the wrong shape, size, or color, right? So now I try to go buy the crooked carrots at the grocery store. Embrace the imperfections because it's still great food to eat. Where is food waste going? A lot of it's going to the landfill. And folks, that's making things even worse because when you pile food waste underneath other trash, oxygen can't get to it. And it creates anaerobic conditions that cause methane. 
and methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Some food is being rescued and sent to food banks. The federal government loves seeing that and encourages food donation. In fact, you're protected at a federal level from liability when donating food through the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. So if anyone tells you that they can't donate because the federal government doesn't allow them, that is not true. We do allow and encourage and protect you so that you can donate that food. What do we do with food waste? Start at the top with source reduction. Prevention is key. Why are you wasting food to begin with? Tackle that problem first. Unfortunately, businesses start at the bottom. They may want to do something about food waste and they'll just go straight to composting. And composting is great. We need composting, but start at the top. Exhaust these opportunities first. And there's good reason for that. Let's look at the emissions impact of these different things. Here's landfilling. It creates additional emissions above the zero. Composting is better, right? But source reduction is way better. Why is that? It's because of where the emissions occur along the supply chain. You know, we see, we want to reduce the carbon footprint of our food. So we think we can just buy local, right? A lot of people, they call themselves local fours, right? They only buy local food thinking that they're greatly reducing their emissions impact. Now, there's a, gr there's a great many reasons to buy local, and we encourage you to do so. But from an emissions standpoint, despite the level of attention it receives, transportation from farm to retail accounts for only 6% of supply chain energy use, right? So you're, you're barely scratching it. What are the main sources of emissions then from food waste if it's not transportation? Well, it's enteric fermentation from ruminant animals like cows and their breathing. It's emissions from the animal waste itself from cows, pigs, and chickens. And it's nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer application, whether that's to fertilize food to feed humans or to fertilize food to feed the livestock. Right now we know. Okay, it's important to know where the emissions and resources are being used. A lot of, a lot of the actions at the farm before it even gets on the truck, right? What can we do to prevent food waste? We've collected uh, best practices, successful um, you know, practices that we've collected from businesses. We put them in these easy to read one pager checklists uh, so that you can um, hand these out to businesses, schools, universities, grocery stores, right? To figure out how to prevent food waste before it's generated. We also have a guide for folks at home. Do your part at home. You know, we waste food bit by bit every day, but it adds up. There's an app for how to keep food fresh longer. A great thing businesses can do is to do a food waste audit, right? See what you're throwing away and measure it. Easy stuff. We have even have a guide for schools. Kids can do this stuff. They're capturing how much food is being wasted, what types of food, and why. They're actually interviewing each other and collecting that crucial data. Here's a picture of an audit station. You just need some tables, buckets, and a clipboard, and you can do a lot of damage. Here's some pictures of food waste. And other waste, right? A lot of companies will see this. They'll see their trash and focus on the plastic waste. And thank you for reducing plastic waste, but don't forget about the food waste. Now, when I see food wasted, I see the resources wasted, the water pollution, the groundwater depletion, the habitat destruction, right? We're living in a massive species extinction event right now, right? I don't want to use more land than I need, okay? And emissions impact. Climate change is, is unjustly impacting communities around the world. Let's look at some of the data from a food waste audit here at, at one school that we did. You can see, for example, a lot of rolls and mashed potatoes were wasted. That's what we see. You might also want to look at the emissions impact from your food waste. Reasons for loss. You're going to get common reasons for loss. Every time we do this, we're saving the kitchen money. Like this one, stir fry had too much sauce. So the kitchen staff just puts less sauce on the stir fry now. They're saving money on sauce. They're making their customers happy and they're reducing food waste. Everybody wins, right? This is profit driving solutions. Now, we also found at schools, particularly a lot of food that was still perfectly good uh, to eat that was being thrown away. Some schools are tackling this stuff, sending this food home in a backpack or a share table or having a nonprofit come to pick up this food. And there are so many nonprofits Here's Dallas, for example. Every dot represents a feeding charity that has to buy food from the food banks. And they're more than happy to connect and uh, get food directly from grocery stores and restaurants so they don't have to pay for that food. They can just get it directly for free from you. So please make those relationships. 
Let's talk about date labels real quick. This is an example of a food bank that accepts food sometimes up to two years past the use by date. Why is that? Because that use by date does not necessarily mean food safety date, right? So that's a misconception. Now, there are exceptions. Baby food and infant formula, those dates are regulated, but the uh, other foods are not regulated at all. That date label does not necessarily mean food safety. So keep that in mind. You can still eat food sometimes past the expiration date. Different health departments, different cities will have different requirements about food donation. I did um, a survey of seven cities all together in the same area. They definitely don't agree on what should be allowed or not allowed. Reach out to them, talk to them, see what their concerns are and, and see what uh, requirements they may also have with donation. Here's a tool that can calculate the direct emissions impact of different types of foods or plastics, materials, so you can compare them. What you wanna do, do you wanna reduce that material or compost it, recycle it and so on, check it out. How much emissions are we talking about? Food waste, how about 42 coal-fired power plants? That's a lot. And enough fertilizer to grow all plant-based foods for US human consumption, right? That's tied to that water pollution. And when we waste food, we waste land. How much? How about enough to cover California and New York State combined? Now, I want you to imagine this for a second. Imagine if we stopped wasting food and we could free up that land and return it to nature right? Nature could rewild and bring back pollinators and biodiversity and wildlife and sequester carbon all at the same time. And it turns out to be a lot of carbon. Check this out. A crazy finding of our report. Even if fossil fuel emissions were immediately halted, current trends in the food system could preclude the achievement of limiting global warming to below 1.5 degrees. Incredible. What? Even if we stop the emissions, it's not enough. That's right. We have to address our food system as well. So how do we do that? Well, many of the studies presented in this report compared a variety of strategies, including closing yield gap, increasing resource efficiency, dietary shifts, and reducing food loss, finding that only in combination could these strategies achieve a sustainable agricultural future, which means if we want a sustainable agricultural future, we've got to do all three. We have to change our farming practices, change our diets, and stop wasting so much food. And we have to do all three together. We can't just pick one. You know, we can't just wait on the farmers to solve this for us. We have to do our part as well. They need us, right? So we've got to do all three if we want a sustainable agricultural future. And another finding of the report, among food categories, animal products require the most land, water, fertilizer, and energy, and emit the most emissions per unit of food. What does that look like visually? Here we go. Here's an example of food system emissions alone projected out to the future. We'll use up the remaining budget we have left to stay below 1.5 degrees, that critical threshold that we need to stay under to continue to enjoy a stable climate, right? That's crazy, right? We've already used up so much of our budget already, right? That we now have to address the food system. So how do we get those emissions down? Here are the strategies. Plant-rich diets, right? Eat more plant-based foods, fewer animal-based foods can get us down to 1.5 degrees. Other strategies, healthy calories, farming practices are here and reducing food waste is here. And check this out. If we do them together, now we can get the emissions reductions we need. Not the emissions reductions that make us feel good, the ones we need, right? It's important to look at science to see how far we need to go to have a real chance at addressing climate change adequately. So now we know. Here's my contact information. Please reach out. Um, let's continue this conversation and I can open it up now for questions. Thank you, Stephen. Actually, can we wait till the end and do all the questions at the end? Yes, beautiful. Thank you so much for your presentation. I love your passion and just the wealth of knowledge that you've shared with us. And now we'll give the floor to Melissa. All right, sorry, I'm slow with technology, but I'm working on getting this in presenter mode. Okay, um, thank you, Kathy and, um, and Stephanie for this opportunity to talk with you all today about one of my favorite subjects, school share tables, um, which Stephen alluded to in his presentation. 
Um, and so just so you know, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So I want to start out by having everyone think about the last time you went to the grocery store and bought some loose apples. Um, so some I don't know about you, but it takes me a little bit to find the actual apples that I want to buy. And oftentimes I'm touching different ones before I find the ones that meet my uh, meet my uh, purchase standards. And so um, my question for you all is how many apples do you think that you touch that you do not purchase? And this might sound like a weird question to ask, but um, I'm asking it because this is how health inspectors think. And I want you to try and think like a health inspector because um, health inspectors, when it comes to school share tables, this is kind of a spoiler alert about what I'm gonna be telling you later, but they are very concerned about norovirus. And um, so just want to start out by making sure we're on the same page about norovirus, which is a virus that people often refer to as like a stomach bug or the stomach flu, even though it's not related to influenza. Um, but it is very contagious. And I have some numbers there from the CDC, 52 outbreaks over a 10 year period, which are not from share tables, but they were just in general school outbreaks. And um, there's a prop, there were probably more because this is often underreported. But the thing about norovirus is that it some people are asymptomatic. So some people can carry it and not get sick themselves. Um, it requires a, a host to replicate, but it can survive for a long time under a lot of different conditions, including on the skin of an apple that we could have then put in our mouth. Um, so Today, I'm going to make sure we're all on the same page about um, federal and local policies that are relevant to share tables and school food recovery. And um, we'll talk about strategies that you can take um, to mitigate the risk of norovirus transmission and basically keep your share table as safe as possible and make the health inspectors happy. Um, and We'll also describe different ways you can implement a school share table because, um, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Every school is unique, has different space constraints and different student needs and, and staffing needs. So we'll talk about some options that you might consider. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with some share table 101. So why do we care about share tables? Well, I mean, why do we care about food waste? I, Stephen did a great job, so I won't belabor this point too much, but um, about 21% of municipal waste is made up of discarded food. Um, and as Stephen also mentioned, the EPA has this guidance for us on how we can make the best use of our natural resources when it comes to food. And share tables provide a great way um, of, of, of taking action towards the top. So first thing we can do is reduce, prevent food waste from happening. And then when that's not possible, we should use the food to feed hungry people and share tables can do just that. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. So the official definition of a share table, um, it's basically any place in a school cafeteria where students can donate foods that they haven't eaten yet um, and that they don't wanna eat. And so that picture there is a school share table at a high school in Colorado. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, and the USDA allows um, multiple options for what you can do with that recovered food. So food recovered on a share table can be eaten during this, the meal period. So um, if a student who even isn't in participating in um, the school lunch program or the school breakfast program wants to grab an apple or an orange off of this share table, they could, or maybe a student who is participating is still hungry and wants another serving of fruit. This food can be donated to feed hungry people either by a, a nonprofit off, of, off campus or if you have a school backpack program or a school pantry, um, those are ideal settings for leftover share table food. And it can also be used in future meal service either as like a cooked item or you can even reservice that food as, as a part of another reimbursable meal, which we'll talk more about in a minute. 
And um, our research group has done research on what's the most viable or realistic way to recover foods in school settings and share tables were the most realistic way. And particularly when it comes to recovering um, food that would be considered plate waste. So food that the students are wasting and not what's happening back of house. So um, you may have already seen the USDA's guidance document on share tables. So you can Google that SP41-2016 to get the share table memo. I also want to make you aware of FNS instruction, instruction 786-6, which is the reimbursement for recycled milk and other meal components. And so that one is particularly important for for schools or school districts who want to reserve items that are not taken off of a share table. So if you put, so going back to that apple example, if I donate that apple to the share table as I'm a student now, and I donate that apple to the share table, I've already you know, purchased that apple as a part of a reimbursable meal. And then if that, if the food service staff, you know, wash that apple and put it back on the service line, and then someone else takes that apple as a part of their reimbursable meal, the USDA is basically allowing that apple to be a part of multiple reimbursable meals. And so this is a way um, that, you know, we can, we can cut some food costs. And also, you know, I don't know about you all, but the schools up um, in Illinois, where I'm at right now, um, they're dealing with a lot of supply chain issues still. And it just is frustrating to know that we're, we can't, we're, you know, it's hard for us to purchase food that's ending up in the landfill. So being able to reservice um, some of those items can help with some of that supply chain um, supply chain headaches if if we all start doing it. Um, some states like Louisiana um, do provide their own share table guidance, and so um, the Louisiana Department of Health does have a document called the guidance guidance for use of share tables that you might want to look up if you're in Louisiana. Um, and the Louisiana Department of Health does allow for variances to be submitted. So basically that means they are allowing for, for um, schools to get special permission to have share tables. So what can be recovered on a share table? So um, one of the most common things are things left over from breakfast. So I'm talking about like unopened prepackaged like muffin items or like those bagels, like things that are prepackaged. Um, wrapped produce, fruits with an edible peels like oranges and bananas, which have kind of nature's packaging to, you know, to keep it, keep it safe and limit that cross-contamination risk. Unopened prepackaged TCS foods. So when I say TCS, I mean time and temperature control for safety. So things like milk, string cheese, and yogurt, um, as long as you're doing something to keep the temperature safe. And under certain conditions, Un unwrapped fruits with edible peels and things that are never allowed on share tables are foods brought from home, foods that can be resealed. So think about your clamshell items. You know, we don't want someone opening up a clamshell, taking maybe a lettuce or whatever out or taking a bite of something and then closing it back up. The health department does not like that. And then of course, compromised package items, things where the packaging is damaged. But really, the bottom line is, is the USDA requires all share table policies, all SOPs or, you know, whatever, um, you know, whatever um, procedures are going on at your school, they have to be approved by the local health department. And so, um, you know, but but what you should really be thinking in terms of things you have the potential to be recovered are things that are sealed, unopened and uneaten. So the reason why, and Stephen re referred to this too, the reason why it's so it can be so tricky to tell people how to um, run a share table is because of the differences in how the food code is applied. So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has a food code, but it's not a real regulation. It's just guidance that they provide, and it's up to each state to determine how they interpret the food code and how they're going to enforce the food code. And so... Um, there, to complicate matters further, 
the home rule allows county and local governments to set different regulations than the state. So this is why the Louisiana Department of Health will allow a variance. They will allow local health departments to talk with, you know, school district manager, um, school district administrators or school um, school managers and figure out a way to make share tables safe that'll work in that specific region, which is a little bit frustrating because in reality, what's safe in Louisiana should be safe in Alaska and Texas and everywhere else in the country. Um, so this is, you know, this is a challenge for us all. So just to give you an idea, um, this map shows the which food code was adopted by which state. So you can see there's a lot of variation um, and with Louisiana having using the 2001 food code and none of the even the states surrounding it are using the same food code. And there was just a recent new food code, the 2022 food code that was released in December. So um, there'll be even more variation than what's pictured here soon. Um, and so why is food safety a big deal? Well, anytime you're trying to reduce food waste, you really should be thinking about food safety because when we recover food or we reuse it in a different way, we're adding additional steps into the process, which adds opportunity for cross-contamination and um, you know, hazard amplification due to time and temperature abuse. So um, our research team, we wanted to better understand the health inspector perspective because it can, you know, it's it's hard um, when one health inspector will allow something and another one in the next county will not. So we wanted to get an idea of why this is the case. So we did a qualitative study where we interviewed health inspectors in urban and rural areas across the state of Illinois. Um, and we did a hybrid um, inductive deductive coding technique to um, identify themes. And so some of the main findings, well, the most important my finding in my mind was that um, contamination was the primary concern for foodborne illness. So um, they were concerned about foods touched by, so going back to that apple scenario, they were concerned about if I were, if I put the apple on the share table, but I have norovirus on my hands, and then the next student takes that apple from the share table and eats it, then that student could get norovirus from me. Um, they weren't as concerned about temperature abuse making someone sick because lunch periods are pretty short. And um, if there was some spoilage going on, there would be changes in taste that would occur. And so someone's not going to drink the whole whole carton of milk. They're probably going to take a mouthful and want to spit that out. And also that milk is already pasteurized before it gets to us. But I will say temperature abuse can change the quality of milk. So if you if your students are complaining about the milk clumping up, um, that's a sign that their milk is being held um, at a too too warm of a temperature, maybe when maybe it's not getting put away fast enough after it comes off the truck or whatever. Um, they also mentioned allergies, but that was a secondary concern. And so it was interesting. We had um, some varying opinions about how risky recovering apples, in particular, um, unwrapped apples, what actually are. And so we had about a third of participants who did not view recovering whole apples without wrapping as a, as a big risk. So like it says in this quote, share table cross-contamination is no more of a risk than whatever the students would be doing when they play on the playground or they give a hug in the classroom. I mean, so we had some health inspectors looking at the big picture and thinking about, you know what, students are interacting a lot during the school day. They um, they are coming in contact with with each other tremendous and a lot. And so having a share table isn't really increasing that risk. So some people who took the big picture into account didn't see share table recovery as risky, whereas those who who looked at it as more black and white. Technically, yes, share tables do increase the opportunity for hand-to-hand -hand contamination to, to occur. And they said, no, we shouldn't allow apples on the share table. So we had unanimous consensus that health inspectors desired more communication with school nutrition staff. In theory, a lot of them thought share tables were a good idea and they were very 
interested in talking more with school staff. They had the um, feeling of, you know, health inspectors are experts in food safety and school nutrition services staff are experts in child nutrition programs and that they were really looking to school nutrition staff for um, ideas about what would work in their setting and what and coming up with a plan together. So, you know, this kind of supports the idea that you should not feel hesitant to contact your local health inspector to figure out something that will work. They also felt very strongly that um, particularly the person who would be the share table monitor, so whether that's the, per the cashier or whoever's going to kind of keep an eye on the share table during lunch, it was imperative to that those individuals were up to date with their food safety and allergen trainings. There were a few concerns that came up less frequently, but you know they were talking about with donations, there was concern for temperature abuse when food was taken off site. And there were a few um, people who were concerned about the potential for like milk, for example, to end up on the share table multiple times and go back into recirculation, back on the share table, back and forth. And so about not being able to track that, that was, that was a concern. So, Hearing their concerns, what do we do to mitigate the risk, particularly the risk of norovirus? So um, our team did a quantitative microbial risk assessment, which is a fancy way of saying we did this simulation where we tried to use information that's found in other research studies about norovirus transition transmission and apply that to school. So we set up this simulation where of like, students um, going through the lunch line and repeated that through multiple lunch periods, through multiple days, through multiple years, in order to estimate how likely a share table was going to make a student sick from norovirus. And so I have the results down here. And um, so it says 100% here as baseline traditional cafeteria. So having a share table or, no, or risk uh, mitigation steps is not going to change the number of people who already have norovirus coming into our cafeteria. So no matter what, at baseline, the prevalence of illness is 100%. So the thing to look at is how different these other options are from 100%. So a regular share table, a traditional share table does increase the potential prevalence of norovirus by about 6.8%. 6.8 percentage points. But there are things we can do to, to eliminate that risk. So one thing we can do is a specific type of share table called a one-way share table, which I will go over in a few slides. And then the other ones that can make a really big deal is by having hand washing stations or hand sanitizer stations, which can um, makes the risk even lower than what it would be because students can, kid could in theory um, get norovirus or have that hand-to-hand -hand contamination during their time in the lunch line. So by having them get rid of the norovirus on their hands before they enter the lunch line is one of the most effective things that we can do. So, you know, having this healthy environment, which along with hand washing, continuing some of those kind of COVID policies of staying home when you're sick, that won't help everything because, you know, some people don't have symptoms of norovi norovirus, but that will certainly help. So um, another thing we can do is wash apples that are unwrapped. We can wrap apples, but personally, I wouldn't recommend this because of the labor, you know, that takes a lot of people power to do, and it also adds more plastic waste. And then, you know, keep doing a temperature bath. I think in Louisiana, they do not want wet ice. They want ice sheets or, you know, other ways, just not, not wet ice. Um, so there are two types of share tables. The first one is the which is more more traditional. The more traditional type of share table is a two-way share table where students can freely take food off of the share table and put food on it without any additional safety food safety mitigation steps happening. Um, and then the one that I do want to talk about is one-way share table. So this is when items 
students can put items on the share table, but they can't take anything off of the share table until additional safety measures have taken place. So let's break that down. There's two different, there's two different options here. Um, so one is probably the most conservative. So this is happens when you have a really conservative health department, which is students can never take items off the share table. So basically you can see here, they have the share table set up as a part of the um, you know, trash disposal process. And they would basically put any uneaten items that are, could be donated somewhere else or put into reservice. Um, you know, in this in this case, they have a cooler and some bit baskets here on the other shelves. Um, something that um, another option is that students can take items off of the share table that were collected from either the lunch period before or say school breakfast, um, the breakfast period for that that first lunch, and so students could. Um, the sorry, excuse me, the nutrition services staff would put items that are available for students on the top shelf and then use the shelves on the bottom for students to place items that they're not going to eat. And then in between lunch services or in between breakfast and lunch service, nutrition services staff could wash fruits um, like your apples and your pears and things with edible peels and then throw away anything that shouldn't doesn't belong on the share table. So which one should your school do? There's pros and cons for both. Um, the nice thing, one of the nice things about a two-way or a traditional share table is it allows students who do not participate in the National School Lunch Program to have access to healthy foods. Um, you can still donate or, um, or reservice any foods that are unclaimed that, you know, that students don't take during the lunch period. It provides additional choices, which, is kind of a double-edged sword because choices are nice because we know students are more likely, if there's more choices, they're more likely to have something the students will want to eat. But also, particularly with our youngest students, they have a hard time, sometimes they have a harder time making the choices and it can cause bottlenecks um, and you know add more time, um, take away more time from their seated lunchtime when they have more choices to juggle. Um, Two-way share tables also are less safe, it, you know, particularly when it comes to norovirus. And, you know, it's it's really up in the air how realistic it is for a student to have multiple servings of, of a fruit or a milk during a really short lunch period. Um, and is that really healthy for us to be encouraging them to do? And so, you know, maybe it's better for us to have this stuff um, have a one-way share table and then give the stuff to a backpack program so students can take it home when they don't have access to food. And so we just don't know if with a share table are some students taking an apple from the service line and then getting an orange from the share table and only eating half of each one. So that's, you know, we're doing research to find out the answer to that right now. Um, but that's just something to consider. So if your school has a very short lunch periods, you might consider a one-way share table instead, which um, is probably more acceptable to parents who have children with allergies or who are kind of hyper vigilant about food safety. Um, so, um, yeah, you have it. You kind of you know pick which one sat would work best for your school and which one your health department would be okay with. Something else to think about in terms of implementation options. So some states, and I um, have have guidance about when students can use the share table. So the, the strategy which has the least contamination risk is when students, like as they exit the lunch line, the share table is right there and they immediately can put, put food on there that they don't think they're going to eat. Whereas I know there are some schools, like particularly in elementary schools where they don't want, like they want a more controlled eating environment that um, cafeteria monitors um, will take the cart around and say, does anyone wanna put things on the share table or take things off? But if you do that, or if you collect items during the disposal process at the end of the lunch period, 
you're leaving a lot of extra time for that cross contamination to occur. And so having it immediately after the lunch line is technically the safest option. But just to put in a plug, you know, recovery is a last resort. So thinking about um, what we can do to prevent that waste from happening, probably one of the best things you can do, there's causal evidence that shows that um, when students have more time to eat, they eat more fruits and vegetables. And so doing what we can to either increase seated lunchtime, the duration of the lunch period, or thinking about ways to make um, lunch lines and disposal procedures as efficient as possible so that um, kids have more time to eat. There is some observational evidence that when you have recess before lunch, that that can reduce food waste. And then as Steven mentioned, provide there's a lot of anecdotal reports about how providing opportunities for students to give feedback on the meal um, can help reduce waste as well. So in conclusion, you know, the best thing we can do is first try and prevent food waste from occurring. Then we wanna try and create a healthy environment with hand washing or hand sanitation um, practices. And then you also just keep in mind, you have to discuss your plans with your local health department. And when you do, be prepared to share how you're gonna mitigate the risk of norovirus. And also don't forget to spread the word about your share table, particularly parents with allergies or who, or parents of students who are on a, um, like a medical nutrition therapy, um, like a diet for weight, for um, weight maintenance or, or other things like they need to talk with their children about how they want them to engage with the share table. And also the more people who are aware of the share table, the more they will use it. Um, I also want to let you know about some free training resources. Um, so the University of Illinois Extension collaborates with the Illinois State Department of State Board of Ed for professional development opportunities for school nutrition professionals. And so you can create a free account and, um, and there's a variety of courses there. These are short courses, including one on share tables. So feel free to utilize this great resource. And I want to thank my co-authors listed there on the left, as well as the USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, who funds the research for this project. And here are my references, and I'm happy to take um, any questions. I'll have, go ahead and stop sharing my screen, since some people might have questions for Stephen as well. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was just such terrific information. I hope we have some questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions? If you don't want to put it in the chat, you can just unmute yourself and shout it out. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, and then we'll do one from the chat. Go ahead. Okay, okay. I'm very interested in doing the uh, share tables because I'm in Cattle Parish, and we do have a lot of food waste, and I've noticed that the majority of the waste is, um, I'm sorry, I don't mind showing my, hello, <laughs> I don't mind, um, of the majority of the waste is milk, and you know, uh, with our K-8 schools, uh, we're not doing offer versus serve. Because with uh, social media and, and children taking pictures and teachers and students of them only choosing two, choosing three things, the plate looks bare. So we've decided to give them everything on the line to ensure that they get a full nutritious meal, uh, but that the items that they're not eating, putting that in the trash and all of that milk going in the trash, I need some help with that. So I have a double-edged sword. I'm trying to uh, handle two things at once. So uh, I saw that slide with some additional uh, assistance that there, the second to the last slide, Melissa, mm -hmm. that you showed something mm -hmm. about the state of Illinois. I really would like to review that so I can get a few more tips on what I can do. And I saw something about milk that you all said. Um, trying to see where I put in my notes. Something about what I could do with the the milk in reference to the shear tables. Do we need to put uh, something with that insul ice or do we need another little cooler? What do we do that the health department would be pleased with us if we allow the children to put their milk back 
how do we do that? How have you seen that accomplished? That's a great question. So um, the, the, what you would need to do is, uh, is again, you'd want to check with your health department before you buy anything. I would, you know, if they say no, then I would hate for you to waste your school's money. But so you can, I, there's like these gel ice cubes that are like food, they're, they're like food grade gel um, ice cubes that you can, that you can uh, get. Um, but I will say for anyone who uses those, we, we're, we have had experience of kids trying to take the gel ice cubes. They think they're really cool. So the way, <laughs> the way we get around that is by putting the gel ice cubes in a zip, in a big Ziploc bag. So they don't, they don't disappear. Okay. Um, so, but, and having that be very close to where the students exit the line. Mm -hmm. And so that they can basically, as soon as they leave the line, put it back put it on, you know, in that basket. Some people use like big, like sheet pans mm -hmm. um, and put them uh, and put the gel ice cubes on that. Um, and then you could, um, it's up to, you know, you, you probably should keep those separate from the other milks and maybe okay. putting them in a different, you know, uh, crate. And, um, and then, you know, you can, you can reservice them again and get credit um, you know, they, they can be a part of multiple reimbursable meals in that way. Um, I don't know. Did that answer your question? It, it does, which just led me to what um, Mr. Stevens said about uh, the best buy date. We really mm -hmm. do have an issue with serving milk like today is the 26th. Um, there's some milk that we had that was dated April 25th that was already spoiled. So, you know, we try to, you know, anything that's the day of, uh, we serve it that day and then we discard and we've noticed that we have quite a bit of that going on. So I'm just trying to reduce the waste in that area. You know, the milk is one of our biggest problems. So it's, um, so food pantries or food banks will accept that milk. So I know um, what a lot of schools will do is especially before, right before a break, like before, you know, spring break or, you know, right before the summer, um, the, the, you know, the summer break, they will, they will schedule um, a pickup from their local mm -hmm. food bank of the milk that they are, you know, that's going to, before it will go away, go to waste. And so that can be kind of a nice opportunity to figure out, a, you know, make some connections. And then you can, if, if it works out and, you know, um, maybe then you could schedule a more routine uh, pickups of milk that you're not going to use. But you might think about, you know, I don't know what your water situation is, but um, if you already have three, you know, at least three components on the tray for your offer versus serve, mm -hmm. you know, just reminding students that they don't have to take a milk if they don't want one. That's probably right. your most, your, right. your best right. we're, we're good with the high schools, but the K-8, <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, I wanted to just also re reinforce what Melissa just said. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I worked with... Um, someone, Melissa Terry with the University of Arkansas, we also found that milk waste was, was a lot. And, you know, some kids can't drink milk. And so she was successful in providing a water cup, a very low cost solution to give students more options because they need those liquids, right? Mm -hmm. And to give them that water mm -hmm. cup as an, as an option, what did result in reduced milk waste. So that was something that Melissa Terry was able to, to do and, and have success with. Okay. Also, there are some uh, brands of soy milk that are nutritionally equivalent uh, to cow's milk and can be used as a substitute. Okay, well, how's the price with that compared to regular milk? It, it can be a bit pricey. Yeah, uh, you'll, you'll have to see. It depends on the, the quantity and, and um, you know, the... The particular relationship you have with that supplier. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think so. Someone asked about in the chat. Um, 
Does anyone have documentation that students on subsidized lunches are not required by the USDA to take milk? I think we've addressed that question. Or do you have anything else to chime in on that? No. Um, Share table memo 41, 2016, yes. Also, if you go to the Louisiana Fit Kids website, we do have, I put the link in the chat. You can see what the requirements are from the Louisiana Department of Health. And as long as you document that information and submit it, they just wanna know your plan, kind of like Melissa was describing with the milk, like how are you going to be saving the milk from the share table? And then just make sure that, the sanit that your local sanitarian agrees with all those things. Um, any other questions from the audience here? Or any other parting thoughts? I think this was terrific. Both Stephen and Melissa, we, Louisiana is on board. We are going to start reducing school food waste uh, one day at a time. So I would encourage all of you that are on the call to come up with some short-term goals for what can you do for your school food service uh, operation. JoLynn, did you have any comments? I was just gonna comment that, um, you know, I was, thank you, Melissa, for the additional information on chair tables and I'm, I'm gonna look everything up. And Stephen, your, your presentation was overwhelming. <laughs> And um, of course, I have been in the, I grew up in a food family. My um, brother's a farmer, my dad was a farmer, and we've also been in the grocery store business. And so, I, I mean, in plate waste and, well, food waste period is, an, is a major issue, and I understand that. And I just wish we could get a lot of people on board. And, uh, and, and I, now that I live by myself, I realize I've been very careful to not buy something I'm going to eat right away, you know, because it's easy to let it sit in there. And it's also too expensive <laughs> to let it, to let it get, you know, to make, to allow it to be thrown away. But um, I'm, I really want to look at your presentation again, slowly when, when it comes back on and we'll get a, we'll get a recording of this. So it was very, yeah. very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, you received the lightning round. And so I can definitely <laughs> go dive deeper in, into any of those slides that you like. I'd love to carry on this conversation. And if there aren't any other questions from the audience, I have a question for the audience. Um, okay. This is something I like to do. You know, did what you hear today inspire you to take action? Can I see like uh, the number of hands raised of, of people who uh, are going to take action in their lives or in their uh, work based on what they heard today? Can I see a? a well, I'm going to raise mine because I can't find my hand raiser. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, but, so I mean, you're, hearing, you're hearing a lot more on TV now, especially with, um, you know, I've been really concerned about water waste. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of information. It really was. Mm. Yeah, I, I can talk a lot about water, uh, you know, our water resources that we all need to share. And I'm seeing a lot of hands raised. So I, I kind of tricked you because now that your hand is raised, you've told the universe and now you have to do something. So sorry, I got you. Well, I feel like we need to, you know, have this uh, meeting a year from now and see how many more share tables and changes we've made in Louisiana. You know, we'll have to see since this is the beginning. Um, but please reach out to, if you wanna reach out to us for specific Louisiana information, anybody who's on the call, just let us know and we can try to help you. But definitely um, look into the guidance for share tables from the Louisiana Department of Health um, to get those things going. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Stephen, for being with us today. We really appreciate you taking this time out of your busy schedules and sharing all the information and we will be posting the webinar on Louisiana Fit Kids website. Stephanie, any, uh, any other parting thoughts? 
Uh, no, this was fantastic. Um, Melissa and Stephen, thanks again so much for coming. And to all of our directors and everyone else that is attending, thanks for everything you do for, for your communities. Well, have a great rest of your day, everybody. And thank you again.